Excellent. Brilliant. Right, Justin, thanks again for giving up your time this morning. I appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to talking to you again. You are very welcome. <laughs> so first of all, before we, we get into it, I'd just like to, I'm always interested in how people have coped or adapted to, to what's been happening recently. So how's, how's things been going for the last, last four months for you? Well, COVID-19 has had a huge impact. I was actually out in the US on a speaking tour. I was meant to be presenting in Utah, Arizona, and New York. All right. And I'd got a call on the Friday night saying, no, it's definitely all still on. So I flew out on the Saturday. And by Monday afternoon, everything was cancelled. And it took wow. me about, about 10 days to get home after that. 12 <laughs> cancelled flights and all those kind of things. Yeah. Uh, but the upside is that I've spent more time at home in the last four months than I have ever. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's been really, really wonderful. I and have the uh, most amazing wife, Ruth, and we've been able to go for walks every day. And, and uh, probably our biggest achievement from lockdown is that we've befriended some robins. Some All right, robins. Wow. <laughs> right. Nice. I think that's been the case for a lot of people, isn't it? People have realised that, yeah, initially it was a shock and people take time to adapt to things, but then they've realised, well, hang on, what's important here? I can spend more time with my family and, and use the time wisely. Yeah. yeah uh, now, I, I'm fortunate enough to kind of travel around the world and I'd love different cultures and, uh, and learning about new things. Uh, but I, uh, there is nothing better. There is nothing more important than family. And family is, uh, and, and there's only so long that you can say it's your priority without actually matching your your words with your actions. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, uh, making it congruent with your actions and your and your words and thoughts. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned robins actually, because where I where I live and I take the dog out for a walk. By the way, she might make an appearance at some point. So if she starts barking, I'll just have to go and let her out. So sorry about that. No, that would be great. <laughs> but um, yeah, where I take the dog walking, um, there's a kingfisher. The kingfisher knocks about oh, around there. So I've been, I've been lucky enough to uh, spot the kingfisher a few times. So that's oh, been my nice. little, my little like mindful moment there, where I feel, I feel quite blessed to have spotted the kingfisher. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like, uh, well, they they do feel really precious moments. Uh, there's uh, some woods near to where we live, and uh, and I was fairly sure that I was hearing a woodpecker. All right. And oh. uh, and so a couple of days of walking in the same area, I would discover the tree. The tree's got more than a dozen holes in it. Yeah. Uh, that they must have been using the same tree for years, but moving up the tree as they go. Yeah. So other birds, uh, smaller birds, are using the, uh, the ones lower down. It's like mm -hmm. they've created a high rise uh, uh, with the woodpeckers right at the top, but then uh, uh, they had these chicks and yeah. uh, making incredible noises. It, was, it just felt like a real privilege to, yeah, uh, yeah. to see Definitely. that develop over the course of a couple of weeks. Definitely. I think it's these moments that we, we need to take more advantage of, really, moving forward once we get back to norm some sort of normality or whatever that new normal is. Well, Look at these moments. There is a thought and, um, well, so I, I was running a session and it was a, a really intense leadership session for people, three days of it. Uh, but even though kind of the days were long, uh, like people would stay afterwards wanting to continue the conversation. Right. So we're having this really entertaining conversation. There's about half a dozen people that have stayed afterwards. And about an hour into it, one lady said, I'm, I'm really sorry. Uh, but I have to take the children swimming, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to leave. And I just said, stop. <laughs> like, let's try that again, where you replace uh, the phrase, I have to, with I choose to. Yeah. And it was this transformational moment for her and for that group, because she stood up and she said, I'm really enjoying this conversation, getting great value out of it, and I wish I could stay, but I choose to take my children swimming. <laughs> and it's then, a and she, knew, mindset, it? Well, yeah. she knew what that meant. That meant I, that even though I've got something that's really rewarding and interesting to me, I choose to invest in my children. Mm -hmm. invest my time and invest in them learning life skills and it was just this beautiful moment and and we need to get much much more used to replacing i have to with i choose to yeah. because we have way more uh, kind of influence 
over our lives, over our careers, over the things that we do, than we either realize or we're willing to take responsibility for. Yeah. So that simple Definitely. thing of crossing out I have to, replacing it with I choose to, is incredibly empowering and also a little bit scary. Yeah, you know? yeah. That it is your choice. You, you have these yeah. decisions and you can choose. Yeah. Yeah, there are no more kind of excuses left. It's a, a kind of extreme responsibility that you take for yourself. Yeah. I mean, that thing about what you're talking about there, like the language that we use is it's quite an interesting thing. And to bring it back around when I did the, the media training course with yourselves for the, the National Lottery, that was one thing that really, really struck a chord with me and resonated. So if I try and build a bit of context for people who are going to be watching this or listening, I attended um, a, a media training day with you on behalf of the National Lottery People's Project in 2018. And it was your company, Mission Group, that ran that training day. Or training, I think it was two days, I think. And um, if you talk about you, Justin, I'll just go over some of the stuff that I learned from you. And you oh, can yeah, you could elaborate and, and go a bit deeper onto some of the, some of the points, if that's okay. Um, so the, the first sort of day we got there, and you, you and your colleague explained to us that you're going to be made to feel uncomfortable during this, this course. It's a safe environment, but you're going to be made to feel uncomfortable. And um, I think one of the first tasks that we had to do was we were stood up, we were recorded, and then our we were played back to the rest of the group. So obviously you can imagine everyone's insecurity start coming out. It's first thing in the morning, we're doing this exercise, and you're just written on the board. So you listen to everyone's insecurities, what the issues were, why they can't do it, all this, and you're just written on the board, get over it get over it and it might sound simple to people who are listening to this or watching it but if you think about like people's fears of being made to look stupid the fear of failure all these things start to come into your, your processes and once you get over that barrier just get over it you're going to be doing it just do it and get over the worst case scenario and that was massive for me that it might sound so simple but things that i've gone on to do after that course and as a result of it come down to really that getting over that barrier so th thank you. That was one of the points that I got from that training course anyway. No, well, you're really welcome. And uh, I mean, this, uh, again, with the context, so ITV uh, could run uh, uh, an opportunity each year for charities to, uh, to get funding, but it means being recorded and played out live uh, on TV. And for lots of people, that's an intimidating opportunity. And, uh, and so we get called in and we go to each of the ITV studios around the UK. And what people think they're going to get is a day where they, they learn how to handle media better. Yeah. And I, I think that people do go away with that, but they get something much, much more profound, uh, which is really kind of, uh, it's here and it's here, it's figuring out why do I want to do these things? And if I want, really want to do these things, what am I willing to get over? What am I mm -hmm. willing to give away? And uh, absolutely, we start by, uh, by telling people that they will feel uncomfortable, and I think we deliver on that. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, uh, yeah. But we, uh, as a result of uh, kind of spending time with these organizations, we developed what we call a series of brutal lessons. And, and you picked up on one of those. Yeah, and and it's just almost nobody enjoys the sound of their own voice. Almost nobody enjoys how they look on camera. Yeah. And I can work with a, like very big name chief executives who are, are totally in control of a room right until they know that there is a, a recording device pointed at them. <laughs> at which point they they struggle to remember their own name. Yeah. I, this is just a, it, it seems like a very unnatural thing, uh, but there really is only one remedy, and that is to hashtag get over it. Get over it, yeah. So just, like, just accept, yeah. accept that that is, you're, you're not going to sound like you do in your own head. I, I, I wish I sounded like on camera and in recordings, I wish I sounded like I do in my own head. <laughs> yeah. right? uh, but you just have to figure out, well, is, is that worth the price. If, if you're representing a charity and you've got the opportunity to go on uh, on television and get out to a large audience, is it worth feeling vulnerable in order to achieve that? And exactly, yeah. when, when you make that mental decision that, yes, that is worth it, actually what happens over time is that you, you stop feeling quite so vulnerable. 
Yeah. And, and that's fantastic to see how you've applied it you know, to other areas of your life because yeah, I'm, I'm way more interested in somebody's life than I am about one specific opportunity. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Uh, I think, um, so I, I, I took from it that get over it and it's kind of, if you can handle what the worst case scenario is, and in that instance, the worst case scenario is, is that I either forget words or I look a bit stupid and I'm all right with that to get a bigger message across or to, to have an impact on somebody else's life or journey, then I'm willing to look a bit stupid just to get something across. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and that's great to hear, uh, whatever it is, a couple of years on, uh, yeah. but also that like, when we think we're going to look stupid, the vast majority of people like, uh, are not thinking that what they're thinking is you're a real person. You're yeah. kind of like me. Yeah. <laughs> like you, I can relate to you. Yeah. Yeah. And, that that and, kind and of brings me, yeah. sorry, just yeah. that kind of brings me on to the, the, the second point that I really took away from, and it was more towards the end when I was reflecting on, on a lot of the stuff that we covered. And um, it was that, what is it? I don't want to get it right. Purpose is always about people. And it's something you've just touched on there that we don't want to really know like the stats and the figures and how many people out of a hundred improved confidence or improved well being. What did you do for little Billy? What did he do as a result of being on your training course or whatever? Yeah, that was massive as well. Yeah. No, well, thank you. That um, This all stemmed from the very first session that we ran. And there was a, a, a lady who had helped set up her own charity. And, uh, and of course, as, as you know, in the room, you might have founders of charities or people mm-hmm. who are working at some level in that charity uh, together. And so she obviously knew all about her charity. She set it up. Yeah. And yet, every time she stood up to speak when we were recording, it, she was trying to, well, first of all, she was trying to get it right. As if there is like something that is right. Yeah. So she was trying really hard, concentrating really hard, and she was trying to fit in all sorts of information. So she was telling us how many collection vehicles she had, and and what uh, it was a social enterprise, and the different qualifications that people could get, and mm-hmm. uh, upcycling uh, kind of furniture, and and the more information she tried to force in, the yeah. less we could feel it. Yeah. And we. Until you make a connection with the, the feeling of why it's important, you literally don't care like, about <laughs> the facts. Because like, you can't care. You've, uh, the caring is a feeling. Yeah, like, so yeah. you've got to connect with the feeling like, before you can connect with the facts. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and we, we've done a couple of iterations, and frankly, it was getting worse for her because right. she was getting more and more anxious. And so I called a break, sent everybody out, and I'm literally sat next to her praying like for inspiration. How can I help? And then the inspiration came and it was this. And I just turned to her and said, has there been, can you think of one person whose life has been blessed by the work of your charity? And my only criteria was you must have met them. You must have looked in their eyes. Yeah. And I knew exactly the moment that she thought of that individual because her whole countenance changed. She went from this state of anxiety and suddenly she's saying, Oh, no, I know a family. I said, well, tell me their story. And she said, I'd need an hour. It's really complicated. I'm going, you've literally got two minutes until people are coming back from this break. So tell me what you can. So she tells me this story. And when she finished, I relayed it to her and I said, stop me if I make any factual errors. Uh, and it was this, like, um, a man's hu- uh, wife went into hospital with a routine operation, but unfortunately died on the operating table. Right. When she lost her life, he lost his job and the family lost their home. Our charity came along and turned their, uh, their social housing into a home at no cost to the family. Fantastic. And it's less than 20 seconds. And there's all sorts of information we don't know. How old were the children? How many children were there? What nationality were there? And none of that matters because I know enough to care. I know that this charity made a difference to this one family. And when I know that it can make a difference to one family, I can imagine it making a difference to 10 families or 100 families. 
And so it's directly from that experience that that phrase that I shared with you uh, came out is yeah. that purpose is always about people. Yeah. She might have thought that her charity was about recycling furniture. <laughs> no, <laughs> like, it's about people. It's about blessing people's lives. Yeah. And it doesn't matter whether you're running an equine uh, kind of therapy charity or a martial arts charity or, uh, or running a business. It's always about people. Mm. And we can very easily get disconnected from that. Yeah. In, in the charity sector, like you spend your time filling out forms and applying yeah. for, uh, for yeah. funding. <laughs> and so I, I will meet people who work in the third sector and, uh, and what they're talking about is, oh, we have exponential growth or we have latent demand in a, okay, like, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> like, <laughs> let's get rid of all the jargon and get back to what it really means. Yeah. And it's about individuals making their eyes shine right, and blessing their lives. Yeah, and that's what it's about. You've just reminded me of something else then as well. Um, that's why I was laughing partway through that because um, I think we had an exercise where any time a buzzword or any jargon came out, it was all like the, the jazz hands yeah, type We thing. had to do jazz hands, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was another thing that just sprung to my head all about that, actually. But yeah, that was that was a good one as well. Yeah, try and, try yeah, and not well. use these these jargon and the, the, the buzzwords in the, in the sector and all that, get away from using those words and keeping it, keeping it real almost. Yeah. yeah. And, and again, this is true for, uh, for anybody in any organization or just in real life. Why do we have jargon? In fact, uh, couple, uh, less than a mile or so from where I'm sitting right now, uh, like when I first moved to this area, because uh, originally I come from the South, but uh, right. I've lived in Yorkshire for, uh, for some years. When I first moved to this area, I was looking for an address and it's pre Google maps. And, uh, and so I, I stopped and asked a local and I said, well, uh, so where, do you know where Richard Shaw Lane is? And, and they looked at me and they were like, Richard Shaw Lane, never heard of it. Right. I go, well, uh, and I showed them the piece of paper and it clearly said Richard Shaw Lane. And they said, Oh, you mean Rick Shaw Lane? <laughs> like, I'm like, what? <laughs> How could you end up pronouncing that? Like, and it just is a way of, of saying you're not from around here because jargon is about saying who's in the club, who's in the know. Uh, uh, right, so and, yeah. Uh, yeah. and every industry has it. If you're in the media, you'll talk about doing a live OB and throwing from studio A to B. And, uh, and it, or if you're in the army or if you, uh, every, every industry does it. And it's just a way of saying uh, in you're in the club. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And, and, and when, you, when you have the club, you have people on the outside mm -hmm. uh, and, and our job and certainly in a charity is about bringing people in yeah, rather than so, keeping yeah. people out. Definitely. I never thought of it like that. Yeah. Yeah. That just comes to me then the jazz hands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that <was good. laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty effective way like, of, of uh, beginning to recognize what, um, what jargon you're using because it can become, uh, you, you get so used to using it, you're blind yeah. like, to it. Yeah, well, it must have had an impact for me to just recall it then in that moment we were talking, the, the imagery of the jazz hands and that. So definitely it's, it's in there somewhere, yeah. <laughs> well, another uh, quick uh, kind of anecdote from, uh, from one of those uh, ITV sessions that we were running. This happened yeah. to be up in the Granada TV area. And, uh, and we, we sat around just kind of getting people to introduce themselves in the morning. And this one lady is, is telling us uh, that, uh, she's very proud of her charity that she set up, which was uh, looking at, well, it's a respite care home uh, for young children. Yeah. And she was telling us about the exponential growth and like all these different things. And I'm like, stop, stop. I mean, she sounded like she just walked off the set of Coronation Street and yet she's <laughs> using all this business jargon. Uh, we just said, stop. Just how would you explain what you do to a seven-year-old? Yeah. She said, uh, and you'll forgive my attempt at the accent, she said, oh, that would be different. I'd say, we look after children who are so poorly, they're not going to get better. That's massive, that's powerful. And the entire yeah. atmosphere in the room changed. And it's not like those people didn't know what, like, what she did, mm -hmm. but then we could all feel why she does what she does. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and, that's something and that, that like tugs at your heartstrings, isn't it? You can, everyone can relate or empathise or know someone, yeah. know someone who's, who 
dealing with something like that. Yeah. And I, I don't mean in a manipulative kind of way. This was actually her just speaking the yeah. truth and speaking from her heart. Now, she'd set that up because her godson had died and she didn't feel like he'd had the support that he needed. Mm -hmm. I mean, she couldn't have been more passionately connected yeah. to the purpose for setting up this charity. Yeah. And yet, after years of going into boardrooms and looking for funding, right, she's talking in this very disconnected way. And yeah. it only took a second right, to get back <laughs> to the real purpose. Yeah. I mean, that, like I said, that, that really resonated with me because... Only, only, I've only been in the, the third sector, maybe like, I think it's five years now, coming up to five years, and I do catch myself using the, the jargon and the terms, trying to sound clever and all this, like I know what I'm talking about, but yeah, I still I come back to that. That purpose is all about people. Yeah, I do come back uh, to that. Yeah. Well, that's great. I'm, I'm happy to have that quote on my gravestone, like if, if, because if that just resonates with people, yeah. uh, it was a huge breakthrough for me when I figured it out. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. and, uh, and yeah, I, I do feel like I need to pass on that message. Yeah, no, it was a mass, massive impact. And uh, I think the last thing I'll touch on before we move on, um, the other thing that took away, it was more practical really, but when, when we are in front of the camera and we was being asked questions and then it was played to the, the rest of the group at the time, um, the, the power of the silent pause rather than trying to fill in the gap with a, um, um, it was just the advice I got from yourself and your colleague was take a breath and then answer the question rather than putting, putting words in there that don't need to be there. And so the, the power of a pause, I wonder if you could expand on that for us a little bit. Yeah. So I may have shared a, an anecdote from my work with Esther Ranson yes, you did. Right? because I, yeah. uh, back in my first career uh, I did lots of work with uh, with charities and with corporates in corporate communication mm -hmm. and uh, and over the years I uh, got to know Esther quite well and of course she set up Childline and uh, as well as being an incredibly experienced broadcaster mm -hmm. and then I was speaking to a journalist one day who had recently interviewed Esther and he said, well, during the whole interview, I thought that literally everything she said was the most important thing that had ever been said. <laughs> and I asked him to expand on that, and he kind of did an impression of her answering the question. So he'd ask a question, whatever it might be, all right, so what, what do you see is the future of Childline over the next couple of years? And she would answer it something like this, she'd say. The future of Childline is, and uh, so there would be this pause while she considered, and he he would lean in, like, oh, what's she going to say? Yeah. And I spoke to Esther about it, and uh, and she said, well, it's kind of him to say so. I've reached the age where I actually have to think about my answers, <laughs> <laughs> and. But rather than saying, hmm, oh, I don't know, uh, hmm, what, like she'd just take a moment to collect her thoughts. Yeah. And that little bit of silence allows us to concentrate on what is coming. Yeah, the anticipation so, yeah, the, almost like, yeah, yeah, what's coming, yeah. And I, and I think I probably shared an anecdote from work that I'd done with Terry Wogan as well. Mm -hmm. And most of the time at work with Terry, he was live on air, so you don't get much time for chatting. But on this particular occasion, he was doing something he had uh, he only did once, which was presenting a special songs of praise. And, right. uh, and so we had large amounts of time in between takes that we could have chats. And I was asking him great questions like, how did you become a broadcasting legend, Terry? <laughs> and, and then he could tell me. And essentially he said, well, I, <laughs> you didn't see me when I first started out. He said, because most tapes weren't kept and I bought the rest of them and burnt them. <laughs> he said, because I, when I started, I tried to do it like everybody else, like filling every nanosecond mm -hmm. of, of an interview. Yeah. And he said, then I, eventually I got confident enough like, to realize that that's not real life. And, and actually, the more real I am, like the more people seem to like it. And he said, I just relaxed. And so if I, if, if I forget what I'm saying, I just say, hmm, I've forgotten 
what I was talking about. <laughs> like, like, and, uh, and because he wasn't flustered by it, yeah. right, uh, people just related to him. Mm. Uh, the, the dearly departed, uh, yeah. Sir Terry Wogan. Yeah. Kind of comes back to what we were saying before about the what's the worst case scenario if you forget or miss a line or fail at something. If you can handle it and you just acknowledge, oh, I forgot what I was talking about then. Anyway, let's carry on. It's, it's like it's, it's poets about that. Yeah, it's people, isn't it? People are people relate to people <laughs> they do and and this uh, kind of links to some of our wider work this idea of uh, being willing to be vulnerable mm -hmm. and uh, i mean we we know like, uh, instinctively we don't trust people who never make mistakes yeah I and mean, that's a weird thing to say right? <laughs> but like, because Somehow we know, well, we know that everybody makes mistakes. Like we know that we make mistakes and everybody else does. And if somebody isn't open about that, if somebody's not willing to reveal mistakes that they make, we can't trust them because we know they're concealing things. Yeah, red flags start going up, all the warning signs, and I'm going, yeah, what's going yeah, on here? Yeah, even if we're not conscious of this, like we, we can't trust people who aren't willing to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. But the irony is... We know that we want other people to be vulnerable, but we spend an inordinate amount of time, certainly in our professional lives, pretending we haven't made any mistakes, yeah. covering them <laughs> over. Right? And so conversely, like we, we try to convince people to trust us because we never make mistakes, and we'll never achieve that because people yeah. know that we're not being totally honest with them. Yeah. Right? And so it's this, uh, it seems like this paradox, like that yeah. you have to, show vulnerability, show your mistakes in order to be trusted. Mm -hmm. mm. That kind of brings us on to the, the next sort of idea I wanted to talk about, though, because I know a lot of um, mission groups work is leadership and teamwork and all that kind of stuff, consulting in those in those aspects. So as a, as a leader then, is it important that you, you show this vulnerability, that you, you're not perfect? It's absolutely That's crucial uh, yeah. to show vulnerability. And, uh, and as I say, the, it's a really difficult thing because the more you are kind of looked to as the leader, uh, the more likely you are uh, to shut down any opportunities for people to see your mistakes. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and that is directly the opposite of what will actually build meaningful trust. Right. Uh, so Patrick Lencioni in his landmark book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, it talks about this. It describes it like a pyramid. And if you imagine the, uh, the bottom rung, uh, like, so the, the thing that goes wrong most in relationships and in teams right. is the absence of trust. Mm -hmm. okay. And the antidote to that, the positive behavior, is building vulnerability-based trust. And, uh, and this is different than the kind of trust that you would have in a brand. I, I mean, it, whether you like it or loathe it, you know what you'll get when you go to a McDonald's. Mm -hmm. or a travel lodge or yeah. uh, you uh, that's that's an experiential trust you know you're going to get the same thing each time and you can think about colleagues that you have or friends or family that you have you know them well enough that um, if, if if you give it to bob you know he'll do it last minute but if, yeah. if you give it to um uh, to ravinda then she'll get it done a week <laughs> in advance like that's experiential trust that's but vulnerability good. based trust is when I'm willing to say things like, I'm sorry, like, or I've cocked this one up, I, or I need some help. Regardless of our seniority, you're better at that than I am, and I really could do with your advice. Right. That's the language of vulnerability, Yeah. and it feels uncomfortable, like, because it is uncomfortable, <laughs> like, but it's that that level of uncomfortable like when you're willing to leave your comfort zone just into the uh, to being uncomfortable yeah. that's when somebody is going to reciprocate with vulnerability yeah i uh, i i remember a conversation with a very well known leader uh, who i can never name <laughs> like uh, but you've seen him on the front of magazines and and i was working with him and his senior team and he uh, it, I, we were talking about trust, and he said, people need to earn my trust. Right. 
And I looked back at him. I always use his name there. But I just said, <laughs> how's that working out for you? <laughs> and it was this light bulb moment for him. I mean, he had been kind of in industry for 30 plus years. Right. And he suddenly went like, oh, oh, is that why? Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, if you're walking around assuming that people are guilty and that you're not worthy of your trust until they've proved it to you, right, then you're not going to build any relationships. Yeah, of course, yeah. it, they, it needs to go the other way around. You mm -hmm. need to assume that if you're vulnerable, somebody won't punish you, right? by taking advantage of your mistakes, but is actually going to uh, respond to you and support you. And that's generally how it goes, right. uh, is that if I'm willing to share a vulnerability with you, you are very likely to respond uh, by the figurative arm around the shoulder, pre-COVID-19, mm -hmm. when we were allowed to do that, yeah. uh, uh, like, but, uh, or, or reciprocating with a weakness of your own. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and that is how meaningful trust is built. There just right. is no other way. Yeah, yeah. I think I read, I read somewhere just on your, on your LinkedIn this morning that um, colleague, um, colleagues competing with other colleagues rather than competitors. So we get into the, as a, as a team, competing with each other rather than thinking, well, hang on, how can we work together rather than, you know what I mean, competing against each other. Well. Uh, absolutely. I mean, this, this is a huge theme like, for me, and I, and I know it's a big issue for every global business that we go into. It, it doesn't matter uh, whether it's Apple or Google yeah. or uh, whoever it is. Uh, they, if, if I were to ask the chief executive, what are your three key strategic issues? I can almost guarantee that one of them will be there's too much silo working in our organization. And like what's the problem with silos is that you miss out on synergies. Yeah. Right? When you're busy competing against each other, you're, you're literally missing the point of being a team. Yeah. yeah. Right? You have to figure out who's the opposition. Mm -hmm. And I, I came from a sporting background, thought, uh, wished, hoped that I was going to uh, kind of play professional sport until I blew my knees out. Yeah. And it would have been completely ridiculous if I was playing centre back and I was competing with my goalkeeper, mm -hmm. you wouldn't be surprised if we were losing. Like, yeah. You'd think it was ridiculous. And yet, <laughs> in business and in families, in, in our personal lives, we spend a lot of time competing with our colleagues. Yeah, like something I try and get like, across in. Um, yeah. Sorry, Justin. It's something I try and get across in, in our jujitsu club is when we're training together, we're teammates. We're not trying to win against each other because we're trying to get better. We're not trying to win and be the best in the club. We're competing against people when we go to competitions. We're not competing inside the club because they're our teammates. That's how we get better. Yeah. No, yeah that was, and that yeah, must that be really interesting, interesting in jiu-jitsu where, where you were going to be teamed in pairs right, and yeah. have combat. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Like to it figure comes down out to how we, define, how we define a win and a loss. Like in jiu-jitsu, like you, you, I don't know how much you know, but if, you, if you're sort of in a compromising position, you tap. And to, to people generally, that means that you lost. But yeah. it depends on your definition of winning and losing. You could, you could have put yourself in that position on purpose to try and learn and escape. Uh, and even though you lost, you knew what yeah. you should have done better. So we're not trying to compete with each other. We're trying to learn and get better, if that makes sense. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. I, uh, now, I, I love the question like, because it, it's the right question is what does winning mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, I mean, this ties to my uh, question that I put out to uh, people. I, I asked them, are you confusing your colleagues with your competitors? Mm -hmm. and, you, and, and then I uh, introduced, in fact, there's um, uh, just – an incredible man in any respect. And I happened to meet him a couple of years ago when he was, I think, at 91 like, uh, at that point. Wow. And his name is Dr. Nelson. Right? And so if you, if you rewind to when he was a young man, uh, he was training uh, to be a heart surgeon. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but the received wisdom when he went to university and he had the textbook to prove it, when you read in the textbook, he said, you can never touch the human heart. Right. Because if you do, you will kill the patient and your 
career will be in tatters. And so that was the received wisdom. You cannot touch a human heart. And yet he went on to develop the first heart lung machine, which allows the, uh, the blood to uh, then go out and still be circulated in the body, which therefore yeah. meant that you could stop the heart, operate on it, replace it. I mean, he literally changed the future like, wow. of, uh, of surgery and what we thought was possible. And so he's developing all of this. Like, but by the time he's really uh, kind of developing it, you've got a cold war on and you weren't meant to uh, collaborate with communists. So you couldn't deal with China, couldn't deal with the Soviet Union. And yet he opened his surgery to anybody who had skills and expertise who wanted to learn about it. Right. Brilliant. And, uh, and this would have seemed controversial. So he was asked a few years ago in an interview, so well, like, why, why didn't you, or, 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 why didn't you lock it down? You, uh, you needed to protect the intellectual property and monetize it and all these kind of things. And, uh, and yet you were dealing with, uh, with communists and, uh, and he just said, I've worked out that my opposition was, um, uh, if I get the phrase right, our opposition was illness disease and death everybody else was on my team yeah right, so sometimes i mean you can ask the question of who is my opposition but even more you've got to work out what is the opposition which yeah. ties exactly david with your point of kind of what does winning look like mm -hmm. right? what does it yeah. mean yeah right? We have these kind of really arbitrary ideas uh, and, and really powerful ideas. Right? In order for me to win, you've got to lose. Right? Yeah, so uh -huh. if, I, if I beat you by one, then I'm a winner. <laughs> <laughs> like, but, yeah. but figuring out, like, I mean, if, if you're a heart surgeon and, and you kind of lock away your intellectual property and you operate on kind of one and two and maybe five and ten yeah. here, Is right? that a win, really? as opposed yeah, to yeah. you could change hundreds of thousands maybe millions of people's lives if you're going to work together with people yeah no yeah yeah That's i think it's a profound question yeah yeah what the win is what does win yeah. what is your definition of winning yeah Massive. I, I, I love also kind of that idea of deliberately putting yourself in a position that you're going to struggle to get out of in order to learn. Yeah. Like this ties very much to the growth mindset. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, yeah. people have heard that phrase, but true growth mindset says that the purpose is learning. Yeah. And that's, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, and so, uh, so whether you're working in sales and, uh, and you're hitting quotas, uh, but the, the purpose is to learn. Have I learned something? Uh, have I learned? Uh, and, and the only word, way to really learn is to make mistakes. This comes back to this idea of being vulnerable, being willing yeah. like to lose like, in like. order to win. Yeah. Right? I mean, in in, in jiu-jitsu, like, because yeah. if you stuck to the way you win, so that the technique you use to, to tap someone out, for example, if you constantly do that technique and you never work on anything else, then you're not getting better. You might be winning in your sense of the word, but you're not learning other skills and developing other skills. So, so what, what you've described is the, is the fixed mindset, yeah. right? which is I know what works and I'll stick with that. Uh, yeah. But again, you can see how this is tied to this idea of, of being willing to be uncomfortable mm -hmm. in order to, and be vulnerable in order to make so your next breakthrough. Aspect. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that comes down to the ego then as well, isn't it? Allowing your ego to, to put, allowing yourself to be put into these bad positions. Uh, I know I'm using martial arts as a, an example, but you kind of relates I, I to I that. love it as a way, as an analogy, yeah. 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 So you put yourself in these bad positions, and it's your ego at the end of the day that's going to allow you to do that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah isn't that interesting? Yeah. Uh, we, we end up speaking a lot more about, in fact, as the years go by, I end up speaking much more about the ego uh, now than I did 10 years ago because right. it's just become clearer and clearer to me <laughs> like uh, whether that's because I become more aware of my own ego <laughs> like, yeah. I, I recently quoted um, this uh, a fantastic uh, kind of leadership guru and he he runs these what he calls uh, egos anonymous clubs 
Oh, yeah, uh, like he only that. deals with kind of top uh, CEOs, but we'll get them in the room and then he'll, he'll say, right, what we're going to do is uh, we'll go around the room and each of you in turn has to stand up and say, I'm an egomaniac. And the last <laughs> time my ego damaged a relationship was, oh, uh, nice. and he says, yeah. if, if, somebody, if somebody says, mm, no, nope, I, I can't think of a time, then his stop replies this. He says, I bet you lie about other things too, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's great, like, but because the ego affects all of us. Yeah. Uh, the more aware we are of it, the greater choice we have. Right? But our ego is, is damaging relationships <laughs> like wherever we go unless mm-hmm. we become aware of it. Yeah, yeah. No, it's interesting. I mean, there's that. Uh, there's like a, a a bit of a paradox in in the the martial arts world, and that a lot of martial arts clubs have like leave your ego at the door, you know. So you come in and you've got this growth mindset. You're there to learn and to get better rather than to to win and at all costs. But then in the, in the same idea, you've got to the ego is going to be the thing that allows you to come back and to try and improve all the time as well. So there's that like fine line of how much of an ego do you need to, to be able to come oh. back and keep trying to improve? <laughs> well, this, this might be helpful then uh, because I, I'd spent some, uh, some years thinking about humility. Right. And what does that really mean? And eventually C.S. Lewis, who, uh, who was great at <laughs> like a yeah. phrase, uh, I'd like to give you an insight. Uh, he, I, I read something that he had uh, said, and it, it really resonated with a thought that had been coming to me. And uh, often at the start of a keynote, I will explain that kind of, uh, I am not my job title. Mm-hmm. I, I might have a fancy job title as the founder of this business. I can make up any job title I like. <laughs> uh, and, and, and you might have a great job title, but that isn't who I am. I'm the sum total of all of my experience, all my education, all of my DNA, yeah. all of my culture, all of my successes, crucially, all of my failures, mm. and all of my future possibilities. So that's who I am. Yeah. And all of those things together make me unique. And when something is unique, that is a scarce resource. Like if there's literally only one in the whole history of creation, yeah. like that is a, a unique, uh, scarce resource, which is of almost infinite value. So when you turn up to a team uh, or a business or a, a relationship, like you are bringing this unique, infinite worth right, yeah, to yeah. that situation. Now, combining that with what C.S. Lewis taught about humility, uh, it led me to say that humility is about a, it, humility does not demand that you undervalue yourself. I already established, I hope, that you're of infinite worth. So yeah. how can you undervalue that? <laughs> humility just means that you don't undervalue other people and oh, their right, worth. Yeah. <laughs> and this is a very different way of thinking of it. Again, uh, coming back to this idea of in order for me to win, you've got to lose. Mm-hmm. Uh, humility isn't the reverse of that. Uh, in order for me to be humble, I, I need to lose all the time and you, you need to win. Yeah, yeah. This is about actually seeing things for how, uh, as they really are. I'm of infinite worth and of value. I've got things that I can bring to this team or this situation, this solution. Yeah, and so have so you. Yeah. And so have you. And so have you. And so when you have that man- mindset, when you are seeing people for the value that they can bring, yeah. then That's massive, like, that. you, you yeah, can yeah. be humble without being um, kind of undervalued. Mm-hmm. That's massive. I'm going to take that away now. Yeah, that's good. I never thought of it that way. That's yeah. Is that C.S. Lewis? Did you say has has spoke about humility and that? Yeah. Well, there there was a statement from uh, C.S. Lewis, and if I get this right, he said that uh, humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking of yourself less often. Right. Right. Yeah. So that was his <laughs> phrase, and it came. I, honestly, I 
probably spent four or five years uh, kind of struggling with this idea yeah, of, yeah. like because humility is um is a wonderful uh, kind of character strength uh, and I, I was just trying to figure out what what does that mean how mm. how can you how can you kind of make the most of your abilities and talent uh, yeah. with with that without losing uh, kind of the attribute of humility and, yeah. and, and and it felt like they were in conflict with each other uh, but um, but they weren't is my opinion uh, yeah. and and when I connected um, and certainly reading C.S. Lewis quote helped me connect these concepts of uh, ours as infinite worth because we're unique yeah uh, and uh, and just not needing to undervalue other people if you if we have a true sense of other people's values uh, and, and worth um that doesn't mean that we need to devalue ourselves yeah so if you bring that into like a, a leadership and a teamwork role then as a leader you can understand then that you can learn from everyone as well Absolutely. using everybody else's strengths and that learning everyone is a teacher at the end of the day basically so yeah well, I, he, here is something that we know for sure, because uh, every piece of research backs this up, is that, um, well, the more complex a, a problem is, the greater the need for diversity of thought in the solution. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I could tell anecdotes of, uh, about it, but that's essentially it. Right. If you've got a simple problem, then your smartest person is likely to solve it quickest and uh, great, get on with it. Yeah. But the more complex it is, the, the, the greater need there is like, for diversity of thought. And uh, going back to uh, kind of my previous career, when I, uh, I was often involved in uh, what were meant to be creative brainstorms, and the vast majority of them were terrible. Right. right, because like, they were run really badly. Right, so it would be four o'clock on a on an afternoon, and uh, and somebody would wander around and say, "Right, brainstorm in the boardroom in ten minutes from now," and uh, and you, uh, they they grab the people that they thought could give them the quickest answer, yeah, right, essentially, and and that's not the point of a brainstorm. Uh, the point of a brainstorm is to come up with the greatest number of ideas so that you get the widest variety of ideas before you then uh, come back and narrow. Yeah. So when I was running them, uh, and I didn't know the science behind this, it just intuitively felt right, is that I'd run them and I would get, I would literally invite the receptionist uh, to come and join us and the cleaner uh, to come and join us like yeah. people who didn't know anything about the industry in which we worked uh because and, and it felt very uncomfortable i'm sure they felt very vulnerable <laughs> yeah. sat in this room with people who were meant to uh, for a living come up with creative communication mm -hmm. ideas uh, but almost invariably it would be a thought from one of them a question that they asked or an idea that they'd had that led us to the breakthrough yeah. those ideas would never come fully formed I, but I, I, Ian, the cleaner, he was just gold dust. Right? <laughs> so he'd sit there and uh, he'd be quiet. And I'd, uh, I'd say, Ian, I know you're thinking about something. And, it, and he, he'd kind of, well, well uh, come on, Ian. <laughs> like, so, yeah. Well, I, why had you thought about doing this? And it was never something that we had thought about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then uh, it, the idea itself that he'd come up with isn't one that would work, but it would immediately lead us to, oh, if we scaled that and if we did it, oh, great. Then, then we could bring our experience and expertise into it. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but his diversity of thought uh, was really crucial to us. So I mean, that's just one example of how kind of um, the very fact that somebody's not involved in it is really important yeah We've got a complete outside perspective on it haven't they yeah 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 um I, so i'd like to hear um i like to hear lots of different people's views because yeah otherwise i'm i'm going to get my idea from last year and changed by one percent <laughs> uh, and uh, and that that's okay for incremental improvement but if you want a breakthrough then you need to take creative risk uh, and it, and, and this kind of connecting back to the idea of vulnerability yeah. <laughs> is, is really difficult uh, to achieve because you're not going to make 
uh, kind of you think how uncomfortably in the cleaner uh, uh, was feeling uh, in there but um we had to create enough safety that he would speak his mind yeah of course yeah so th this is the paradox like you need to in order to get creative risks you need to create uh, psychological safety mm -hmm. people need to feel safe enough to take a risk coming back to your jujitsu example like when when you really understand that practicing is about learning it is yeah. about growth then you're going to feel comfortable that you're going to put yourself in a position that you might not get out of in order to try and learn. So you're going to lose <laughs> like, yeah. um, like this particular uh, kind of battle in order to try and like, learn something that might help you in, yeah. in a later situation. Uh, you, you've got to feel pretty safe and secure about yourself. Coming back to the ego, you, you uh, feel pretty safe that, you don't need to win tonight <laughs> like, in order to, yeah, yeah. Uh, to yeah. learn something that's going to be valuable to you in the future. Yeah, definitely. That's massive. It's the definition of your win. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. I know. So just before we, um, we move on to the last sort of thing I wanted to talk about, because I know we said an hour and we're coming up to, to 50 minutes now, but um, leadership and teamwork, is it possible to have a bad leader and a good team or – a good team and a bad leader do they all need to work in one or is it possible to have a bad leader in a good team and a bad team with a good leader does that work or do you need the balance of the beach? without getting into the full definition of yeah. what kind of a good uh, kind of team would be if you want uh, if you want a world-class team that is sustainable then you're going to need uh, both good leadership and mm -hmm. good teamwork there are ways of getting results. Uh, you can look through the annals of history and, uh, and see some pretty despicable leaders uh, yeah. who've achieved some results. Famously, of course, or infamously, Mussolini made the trains run on time. <laughs> in Italy, yeah. right? uh, but is that a trade-off you want to make? And what was the mm -hmm. long-term like, effect like, on the country? Yeah. Uh, and and so, so if you want sustainably brilliant results then you've got to align on, on what is the purpose, yeah. what's the, what is the goal. Uh, that goal needs to be shared uh, amongst the people in that team mm -hmm. because eventually teamwork is the competitive advantage. Right, okay. Uh, it, it's not uh, the finance, it's not technology, it's not any of those things. It's teamwork. Teamwork is... In some ways, simple. The principles yeah. of great teamwork are simple, but they're just really difficult to do on a day-to-day -day basis uh, when the egos are getting involved. And, uh, mm -hmm. and so truly world-class teams figure out their egos uh, and then uh, kind of subdue <laughs> like uh, yeah. those egos in order to try and achieve something together. Right. And if you can get everybody on your team rowing in the same direction at the same pace like you can outperform just about anybody in any industry the only reason i asked that question was i follow um, uh, an american navy seal and i listen to quite a lot of motivational leadership stuff that he speaks about yeah. and one of his quotes is that there are no bad teams just bad leaders and i wanted to just know how how you feel is that true or is it kind of not that simple oh. yeah I, um <sighs> I've I've worked in uh, kind of teams where uh, the the de facto leader uh, might have been a bit of an idiot, right. <laughs> like, like, um, like but the uh, kind of the other team members uh, kind of tried to figure out wh what do we want to achieve, like how how can we work together, and and in some ways kind of um, it felt like. That, ind that individual who's the leader was the opposition. Oh, <laughs> like, right. and, yeah. and then the, the team at least is united in, <laughs> in trying to uh, disprove yeah. or, uh, uh, or kind of succeed in spite of. Uh, but it's not, it's not a sustainable position because what happens is good people leave. Mm. That's what good people do is right. that they figure <laughs> out, I, I can contribute and this isn't the person to do it for. Yeah. Uh, we a well-known statistic uh, is that uh, people don't leave jobs they leave bosses all right 
uh, or, or a well-known saying at least. Yeah. Uh, we know that 65% of people, uh, according to research in America, 65% of employees would leave uh, like their current job to work for a leader who valued them more. Right. And that's not just in terms of, like, I'll pay you more. Like, yeah. uh, people want to feel like they are cared for and that their contribution makes a difference. Right. 25 years worth of research, I can, I can categorically state that leadership matters. <laughs> leadership makes a difference. Yeah. Do you think everybody has got it? an innate ability to lead? Do you think everybody can lead in the right kind of circumstances or is it something that can be taught or are you just naturally a leader? Okay, so uh, absolutely you can learn and apply the principles of leadership and yeah. of teamwork. And uh, there isn't just a cookie cutter kind of model of a leader. Uh, if, and hey, if, if we took politics, for example, uh, you could look back and say, all right, who, which, who are the great leaders? And uh, some of our work, we, uh, we have people do assessments and give them insights into their character traits or their personality traits. And, and there isn't just kind of one type of leader that would always be successful because there are situations which require like somebody who's really kind of driven and headstrong. Mm -hmm. There are some situations where absolutely you would need somebody who, who in, more intuitively uh, yeah. knows how to engage with people that like yeah. there are, so there's a real variety. Like, um, if you're, um, obviously controversial at the moment, but kind of uh, Churchill, uh, Churchill was in many respects, a great wartime leader. Yeah. Uh, not so great uh, in peacetime. Time. Yeah. Right? Uh, so, so there are there are different strengths that you would need at different times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can everybody develop like the uh, the ability to lead? Uh, yes. Uh, that doesn't mean that everyone. It, it, all right, in jujitsu, everybody who comes to you uh, could become better at jujitsu. Yeah. Uh, and and if it, your great coaching will help them become better. That doesn't mean that everybody can become a world champion yeah, uh, in jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Like some people who have natural talent. Yeah. There's, um, Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's definitely possible to improve. And there are, uh, there are certain things that you can do which will lead you to become a more effective leader. Uh, but yeah. that doesn't mean that everybody would be capable of leading um a, a global organization right. right yeah 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 no that's, that's interesting so um just before we we finish off we've, we've already spoke we've already touched on quite a few few of the points i wanted to bring up and we've spoke a little bit about trade-offs and prioritizing stuff especially at the beginning when we're looking at what we've we've learned during covid and prioritizing who we want to spend time with and all this i wonder if you could just touch on before we go essentialism I know we mentioned in our in our conversation before doing this that we would, you'd mention it a little bit and talk about it. Yes, yeah. So um, I guess uh, first of all, is there uh, some context then? So yeah. Uh, so this is uh, I, I have a number of brothers who are authors, and uh, this is one of my brothers, Greg McEwen, who wrote Essentialism, and uh, that's the disciplined pursuit of less. And the title actually came from. Uh, uh, another book uh, by um, a man called Jim Collins, and people have often heard of his most famous book, which is um, From Good to Great, right. uh, and it's an excellent book. His follow-up book to that was Why the Mighty Fall, so his analysis of big companies, very successful companies that no longer exist. Right. And, uh, and he has this, uh, he's identified phases in a, a company's uh, kind of success and then failure and it, it, essentially you start with focus real focus on uh, on the specific idea that you've got you put all your resources and effort into that and then you gain success you have mm -hmm. some form of success and then the next phase uh, is uh, is all about the um, hubris born of success so this idea of uh, the opposite of uh, of humility, of pride. Yeah. Well, we know how to be successful, so we're always going to be successful. The next phase is the undisciplined pursuit of more. 
Right. So uh, yeah, now, if we take say the sporting uh, arena, let's say that you're a um, you're a, a a golfer. You've got natural talent, and you're working really hard. All you want to do is kind of play golf and win golf tournaments. Fantastic. Now, if you start becoming successful, what happens? Well, maybe Nike wants to give you a sponsorship deal. Yeah. Uh, and then media uh, watches and yep, sorts, yeah, uh, yeah. absolutely media interviews and uh, they want you on the cover of uh, Hello magazine. Yeah. And, and suddenly you are given all of these opportunities that success has created for you. Uh, but what happens is that you start pursuing those things yeah. and no longer have that focus on the thing that made you successful. Yeah. Sporting examples, uh, massive, isn't it? You can think of a million and one sports stars who once they started to achieve success in their field, the career started to arguably go downhill from that point. Like, yeah. Uh, oh, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I worry that uh, kind of in, in football, for example, now, like that uh, kind of the, all those trappings that come with being successful on the field mm -hmm. now um, seem to be the attraction of playing football for some like, yeah. of, the, of the upcoming players uh, uh, as opposed to the result of. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, you, this, this is equally true. I mean, of course, Jim Collins' book was about businesses uh, that were failing. Uh, but all, all during this time, the numbers are going up. Yeah. Like, um, and so the, the undisciplined pursuit of more it might be more cars in the car park or bigger, fancier cars in the car park or like more, um, more places, like more offices right? or more retail outlets or yeah. more, more, more. Uh, and, uh, and, and again, the market's loving you because you're growing. <laughs> like, but then eventually there is a downturn. And then in his uh, scheme, you, you then have the relaunch <laughs> and then the failure and then right. eventually ignominious death. I think that's how he <laughs> describes it. Uh, and so these companies cease to exist altogether. But where did the problem occur? Uh, it wasn't when the figures started to turn down. Uh, it was the direct result of decisions that were made some time before that. Right. Yes, when you stop focusing and you go for this prideful, undisciplined pursuit of more. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's, that's where the subtitle came from. The, the exact opposite of undisciplined pursuit of more is this disciplined pursuit of less, yeah. figuring out what is really important mm -hmm. and then cutting out uh, things that don't contribute to the things that you feel are most important. Yeah. I mean, to, to quote Stephen R. Covey, who wrote The Seven Habits of Highly, Pe uh, Highly Effective People, he said the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. I think like that, yeah. <laughs> Deceptively simple, but yeah. really difficult in, in a world that is filled with opportunity. Uh, it's a brief, uh, brief example. Uh, a number of years ago, I was fortunate enough to go to Chichen Itza. Right? So one of the great wonders of the world in Mexico, yeah. in the Yucatan, Yucatan Peninsula. And uh, we'd, I'd gone really early in the morning, so there was hardly anybody there. And you stood in, you've got the kind of big pyramid shaped temple. And uh, as I'd, I'd read up a little bit about it, if you clapped, if you stand in a position, like you clap and then it starts to do kind of seven echoes and it sounds amazing. Right. But also on, on the spring and winter equinox, like the sun uh, hits it at a particular angle and, uh, and the stairs look like a snake that is moving. Really? And you think that's amazing yeah. uh, and my wife was saying wow how did they come up with that <laughs> and my answer was they didn't have tv or the internet <laughs> like, it was the absence of those things like yeah. essentially they were bored <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. and they had a lot of time to think come up with things to do yeah. <laughs> and work, work things out like we we have this idea that, that our brain needs to be entertained all the time but actually mm -hmm. like that stops us from making it stops us from thinking difficult thoughts yeah and, and therefore yeah. coming up with uh, the great solutions and things yeah uh, yeah, like, and, and so this, this idea that, um, well, we, we've got children who have never been lost. 
and that seems like a, I'm, I'm not encouraging everyone to be lost, but if um, because uh, having yeah, GPS, GPS on your phone, phone is amazing. Phone <laughs> like, phone but, on that, yeah, yeah, <laughs> but, uh, but but this idea that uh, kind of you um, you you need some time to get lost in your mind in order to find the way out. Yeah, like, uh, that, that's certainly been true for for kind of the big thoughts that have come to me is that I've needed to feel lost. Like, and that, oh, what does this mean? And how does that work? And how, do, yeah. how, how can these two things be true? And this is a paradox. Of, whoa, like it, it needs mm -hmm. to feel a little bit painful yeah. in order then to, to be lost in that forest and then find the path that leads you out. Yeah. And, I mean, it's not, and, not very often that we see people in, in today's kind of society who are, who are comfortable just sat on their own with no phone with nothing other than their own thoughts it's for a lot of people that will be quite uncomfortable wouldn't it just sit there uh, yeah. with no no distraction no nothing apart from their own self-talk yeah. yeah well I, I was just speaking to uh, somebody uh, on monday and he hadn't responded to a message for two days <gasps> right and that was because he specifically chooses to fast from technology once a month right. <laughs> right, it just it's just one weekend a month like uh, that he, he downs all technology yeah. uh, uh, just to kind of get rebalanced uh, that my uh, yeah. my colleague who I think you met uh, kind of Paul Barnard like he yeah, and his Paul, family yeah. uh, in uh, they they have like every Sunday is a no technology day mm -hmm. right? that's when they switch off the computers switch off the phones yeah. Uh, and uh, and and have to talk to each other, <laughs> like, <laughs> but that's <laughs> like, but that's where you they they have learned over time that that's where great value is. Yeah, like, but you have to make this choice. That coming back to that idea, uh, we now have this unlimited uh, kind of opportunities for entertainment and a distraction. Mm -hmm. You have to deliberately uh, uh, choose to use them or not use them yeah i'm not against technology i love technology right? but uh, is it serving my interest right? or am i giving up my freedom and my choices mm -hmm. um you could you have to be aware of the cost of these things yeah i, li I listen to uh, quite a bit of jordan peterson i don't know if you were oh, yeah. you jordan peterson is and there's a quote yeah. that has come up over the last few weeks people who i've spoke to and i've just this quote keeps keep running around the back of mind and we're paraphrasing it I won't do it justice but he says you're not gonna you'll always pay a price for everything you choose to do you don't get to choose not to pay a price you just get to choose which poison you take everything everything has a price everything has a consequence and there's a trade-off coming back to the, the kind of ethos of the yeah. book there's a trade-off in that yeah. yeah, absolutely. And, and so the idea of essentialism, uh, is, as Greg uh, kind of points out, is, is bear in mind there is a cost for every trade-off. Be aware of the, the cost of your choices. Mm -hmm. right? and so it's about applying design thinking to your own life, to your own career. Uh, he, he says in the book, if you, uh, if you don't design your career, then somebody else will. Yeah. <laughs> right? life is not going to stop like because you're not consciously yeah. making decisions yeah. right? and and so you 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 have the opportunity to influence uh, and uh, and that is going to mean saying no to things that might even be good yeah. because what you want is the better or the best uh, yeah. outcome i think i'm definitely guilty uh, of i'm a i'm a, a people pleaser i will go out my way to try and please people if it if it means even trading off on something else and I do need to start to learn to say no really in the in the kindest possible way to, to say yeah. no yeah well there's there's a there's a chapter in the book which is essentially how to say no without getting fired yeah well I, 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 that was one of the things that came out of the book for me that I've, I've realized I am a people pleaser I don't really say no and one of the the be one of the things that I will take away from the book is an example of where someone's boss asked them to do something and he says, right, well, what thing do you want me to not do? Because I can't do both. But what, mm. what do you want me to do less of? I can't do all things at once. So you ask me to do something. What do you not want me to do? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so and and that's yeah. it's a really uh, um, practical application. And I, I have used exactly that. Uh, right. Sometimes I'm, I'm working with a company and fairly senior people might come to me and say, like, 
I'm, I'm really struggling with my boss uh, because I, I'm, I'm fully loaded and yet he's come up with four new things and he wants them all as a priority. Yeah. As Greg explains, priority is a singular word. Right? <laughs> it means the most important thing. Yeah. Like how can you have more, like more than one most important thing? <laughs> and uh, long before the book was written, in, in my first career, I uh, fresh into it, I'm out at university, go join a uh, communications consultancy, and we're sat in the boardroom with uh, the client. Uh, and the client is saying, all right, uh, we'll, we'll have this, we'll do that, we'll do the other. I've, I'm keeping notes. There's now 20 different things on there. Right. And I'm waiting for our account director right, to... Uh, to say something say all right well actually we can't do all of those but she wasn't going to say anything <laughs> so i kind of took a deep breath and eventually i said patrick um which ones of these would you like us to do this month <laughs> and he looked at me and he said well i don't see why you can't do all of them all the time <laughs> like uh, to which i said as, as this new kind of graduate said patrick i i don't see why we can't charge you anything we like <laughs> you know but, well if you're putting it that way and i said yeah i'm i'm putting it that way yeah <laughs> like, <laughs> like, and, and it was just a i mean it's obvious when you say it out loud uh, but we need to call out uh, kind of these situations in our own life yeah. you can't have everything all the time like therefore you've got to make some decisions mm -hmm. right? and not making a decision is a decision right it, it, those things are still going to happen yeah and it, what i had observed in my brief time with that company is that that client uh, was not one of the biggest clients but they had way more hours spent on them oh. and yet they never seemed to be happy this was the fascinating thing <laughs> is so like uh, maybe they're the amount of money that they were paying, we could have done three things a month for them. Right. They were probably getting 15 or 16 things a month. And yet there was no thanks. There was just, oh, and you didn't do this and you didn't do that and you didn't do the other. And, and so I, I, I figured it out uh, in this kind of brutal thing. And I, I said in this meeting, I said, right, I've got this list of things. So which one is your priority? And, uh, and Patrick said, oh, this is a true conversation. Uh, Patrick said, oh, uh, well, the most important thing is this. And so I put, wrote number one next to it. Yeah. And he said, but before you do that, like, you need to do this. And again, like, okay, all right. So I'll kind of put a <laughs> two next to that. And he said, yeah. but more important than those is this. And I'm like, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> like, like, Patrick, you do not understand the concept of priority. Yeah, <laughs> like, priority so yeah. <laughs> yeah you, you can't have something that's important and that then is the more important. Yeah. And, and, and I realized that there was no way that that client was ever going to be happy unless we decided and, and shared with them uh, this concept if we yeah. agreed three things and we deliver five things they're delighted mm -hmm. if we if we don't agree something then there's always more that could have yeah. been done yeah and so actually the um you could say that oh the client was a nightmare but we were mismanaging the client Right. And, and this comes back to this idea of extreme responsibility. Yeah. Right. What's going wrong? Well, we need to agree what success looks like. Yeah. And then if we match it and exceed it a little bit, then great. Yeah. Right. Uh, but if we, haven't, if we haven't had that uncomfortable, awkward conversation where we agree it, then we are responsible for never being able to win <laughs> like yeah, with yeah, that yeah. client. <laughs> and, and so, so these, these are directly, uh, obviously Greg says them uh, better in the book, but, um, but this is real life uh, where you need to apply yeah. that. It was obvious when it was a client who was demanding more and more, but we need to apply the same thing to us. What if we were our own clients? Like, uh, can, yeah. can we possibly, we've only got 24 hours a day, right? We can't sell 25 hours worth of our time yeah therefore we've got to make decisions yeah uh, and uh, and this isn't about um it, as greg says essentialism is not about saying no to everything but uh, if he would wanted that he'd have written a book saying 
How like to no. noism. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, like you, you only say no in order to be able to say yes to the right things. Uh, right, yeah. Like, so, you, so you have, which means that you've got to figure out what what is the right thing. What, what do, do I really do? Yeah. want? What is most important to me? Yeah. And this isn't about making every second of your day filled like, with with epic things. Uh, I, one um, conversation I had with with Greg once, and he was saying, I want to organize my life, my diary, so that if my son Jack comes into my office and says, hey, how about playing basketball, Dad? Uh, that I could look up and go, yeah, yeah, why don't we do that now? Yeah. That, that's what I want to organize my life. Not so that it is so full of things I can't move, uh, but that I have enough white space to be able to make decisions in the yeah. moment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I think sometimes people get the wrong idea that this is, um, does it require discipline? Yes, it does. But this isn't about rigidity. This is about creating enough space in your life to be able to make decisions, the There's right that decisions. flexibility as well, isn't there? Yeah. 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 No, that's fantastic. Well, Justin, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I could carry on talking to you for another few hours at least, definitely. Yeah. But um, yeah, before well, we go, I just, I just want to say thanks very much again for – for the, the inspiration I got from the, the, the training day that we did and it, it has really resonated with me and I've, I've applied it in, in things that I am doing now. So thank you very much for that. Well, that is exactly why I do what I do. Right? So your feedback there, we're, we're not interested in entertaining people for a day. Mm -hmm. I, I'm totally interested in how what small things could change in somebody's life that they could achieve what they want to achieve that they could feel more satisfied by, yeah. with the work that they are doing and so to hear a couple of years on that you are still using and remembering those principles is uh, that feeds me so thank you for the feedback <laughs> no thank you very much justin i appreciate your time again this morning and uh, have a great day thanks very much you're welcome all right thanks a lot david cheers justin thank you bye, -bye.